welcome back to the live stream. This week we've got Bob Murphy on the show. We're going to be talking about Austrian economics, probably versus post Keynesian economics. What's right? What's wrong? Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. We've got him on the show today. Welcome back. It is September 30th, 2023. You know, on my economic journey right now, I'm exploring all all areas. Um, I kind of started out, well, I go back in 2008 is kind of when my interest in economics started with the great financial crisis. At that time, in a lot of ways, I was very libertarian, right? I had watched the movie um, Zeitgeist and you know, how gold, we were on a gold standard and fractional reserve banking and all that stuff. And during the, the financial crisis, I, I, I finally read um, John Keane's uh, general theory book, considering I carry the um, his, his last name, no relation. Um, and so I kind of got into the post Keynesian kind of um, lane of economics. And then years down the road, I was working at a factory, managing it, and I got into system dynamics, found Steve Keen, um, and started following his work. And I've I pretty much read everything uh, that Steve's written. And he's always been very critical of neoclassicals and, uh, specifically, so I'd always see his footnotes in his writings. Um, and I decided, you know, about a year ago, you know, watching Steve all the time, I noticed he's a great historian of economics. And I wanted to kind of have that viewpoint as well, not just, you know, mathematical modeling, but what, what is the, the lineage of um, economics? So I've kind of started going down that journey. I even just put out a, a little bio video on Milton Friedman of all, all people. Um, so I'm, I'm a lot of this show um, is a translation of my own economic journey, even though it's the Steve Keen and Friends show. Um, I, I book a lot of the guests, right? So I think it's a big reflection of where I am in economics. And that's why we're, we're going to have people like John Hearn and Robert Murphy, because I don't think it's healthy to stay in your own echo chamber. I think it's important that you in, explore all aspects of the field that you're really interested in to get all viewpoints so you can make an informed decision yourself. So that's what we're going to do today. You just saw Bob singing. I think we're going to have a sing-off. Um, between Steve and Bob, I think that's where the, really the the battle's going to be is vocal inflections and the dynamics there. If we can model that mathematically, that would be pretty cool. I'm going to bring on Professor Steve Keen first. Here he is. No way, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to try <laughs> singing. Uh, you know. That that's that's the one thing that my fam, my fan, friends and family were actually like that was have me assassinated over. So I went and flicked it on the audience here. Oh, so are you back in Hungary right now? Yeah, I uh, just went up last week to get my wife from Amsterdam. So we're back down again today and uh, had a function at the centre last night, which is pretty much to introduce me to the the crowd at the central bank here, which was quite good. So mm. um, yeah, now it's going quite nicely. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I think so. We're we're not gonna have Dan here. Dan, um, Dan is didn't want to come on because he's protesting that we've had a, we were having the leading Austrian economist on the planet on. So he decided he didn't want to show up. And Mike Mike's car broke down or something like that. Um, so he's <laughs> you know, trapped in the suburbs should, of Boston. Sounds like should, you should use the lines from the from the uh, blues the Blues Brothers. In the tunnel when Carrie Fisher decides to shoot them both. 
<laughs> That'd be more <laughs> more believable. Okay. Well, Robert Murphy, here he is. Mm-hmm. Welcome in. Robert, how you doing, buddy? Um, now, hey, can we call you Bob or Robert? What do you prefer? I prefer Bob. Bob, okay. Bob. I like Bob better, too. It's more it's more personal. So you're on the Steve and Friends show. Clearly more on the Keynesian side of things. Um, let me let me actually adjust this for you. Uh, okay, there you go. Me, make me big here. Take Bob Murphy. You can find Bob Murphy on X. Bob Murphy Econ on Twitter X. Uh, Bob, what first before we get into who you are, what made you decide to come on the Stephen Friend show? I, I put the invitation out mm-hmm. to you, but what would possess a leading Austrian economist like yourself to come on this show? Oh, well, I'm a big fan of, and thanks for having me, guys. Um, I'm a big fan of dialogue among people that, for me, as long as the person, it's fine if I totally disagree with them and I think even their recommendations are, are horrible in terms of policy. But if I think they mean well and they sincerely believe what they're saying, that's great. You know, I might be wrong on my stuff and talking with people like that, that's certainly going to, you know, grope towards the truth. So, you know, I've, I've liked, and you know, I heard Steve on like Lex Friedman and other things before. So I know he's, you know, an intellectually honest guy. So I'm happy to, you, you don't, when I follow people, you know, on socials and whatever, read blogs and think I, I don't read people I already agree with. I typically go read people that I think are smart who, and also if I can't anticipate what their take's going to be on something, like if I already know what a guy's going to write before I read it, then there's no point in me reading it. But so people like that, and obviously Steve Keen is someone like that. I, I don't know what his take's going to be on something. And you just, oh, okay. So that's why I thought this would be a great uh, opportunity. So I'm happy to do it. Mm. Bob, how did you get into economics? When did that start for you in your life? So uh, when I was like in junior high, I thought I was going to be a physicist. Like Richard Feynman was my hero. Yeah. And that's what I was going to do. And, you know, the doctor, like when I was in school, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be a theoretical physicist. And he was kind of taken aback. (laughs) You know, most kids are saying be president or fireman. Uh, And then, but in high school, I just started reading guys like Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams. And I really love what they were doing. And like the idea of, oh, the market has this equilibrating process involved and people don't plan it. And it, these things kind of happen spontaneously. I really was captivated by that. And then I found the Austrian school and they're like guys like Murray Rothbard, just even if I didn't agree with them, he was just a crystal clear writer. And I could tell, oh, it's step three in his argument. That's where I disagree. But it was, you know, make you think and you can. And then the work of Ludwig von Mises, I didn't understand it fully, but I read his book, Human Action cover to cover when I was a senior in high school and I knew I have to go be a college professor. So I got, went to Hillsdale college, pieces library, and then NYU, which had an Austrian fellowship. And I was in academia for a bit and now I'm, I moved into the financial sector, but yeah, it, as a, as of senior year in high school, I thought I'm just going to be a college professor teaching economics. Right. Steve, hmm. what do you know? What do you know about Bob Murphy? He's obviously a, uh... He's a figure in economics. Tell me what you know about Bob, you know. and, uh, well, and, and Bob, I read Bob's review of my debunking economics uh, pretty much when it came out. I reread it today. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I, I um, appreciate the, some of the intellectual work you've done as well, your critique of Samuelson, for example. I disagree with part of your argument, but I like the way you engage with the capital controversies there. So... Um, and like we had John Hearn on recently, and like you are far more aware of what your ideological foundations are than John will ever be. Um, you know, you're aware there's a history, and you're aware of various alternative schools of thought. I mean, John, as much as I like having a beer with him, I never want to talk economics with him again. It's just so frustrating that he's a walking textbook and doesn't realise it. You've got more more depth than that, and. Uh, so, yes, that was fun to come on. If I can actually give my little personal story, because also, like you, I intended to become a theoretical physicist. I had six years of lousy science teachers, mm-hmm. fundamentally. Uh, and the guy that bored me, he was a, he was a, a Catholic priest. Uh, no, not priest, a, a brother in a Marsh Brothers school. And he was just in, incapable of reaching the, the depths that were necessary to teach me anyway. Um, and then we had a great lecturer turn up whose name was Tim Keating, who's no relation to Australia's ex-Prime Minister, 
same like tyres, no relations to John Maynard Keynes, only not quite as uh, illustrious. And he taught me the thing which really captured me was Rostow's theory of growth. Mm -hmm. And that was a cyclical model with feedbacks to it and so on. And I expected to find that when I got to university. And instead, I found myself being taught equilibrium stuff by a rabidly neoclassical department. So um, I, I didn't know the history when I first turned up. I know it very well now. But the vice chancellor at Sydney University was, an, was a professor of economics at Manchester University in the UK. He came out to Sydney and regarded the course that was being taught. There was a very, um, I'd call it humanist, a humanist orientation, um, Keynesian overall, uh, but uh, with, with a strong basis on you want to have a better society mm. in general, however that's achieved. Uh, and he got rid of those, the VAC course and those professors, installed a, a rabid neoclassical from uh, New Zealand called Colin Simkin, and then a guy called, um, uh, <laughs> I forget his name all of a sudden, Warren Hogan. Um, and Warren uh, really saw himself as rising up the university hierarchy over time, and he bumped into me. So we had a student fight at university over the teaching of economics. And uh, and uh, what I found was the neoclassical stuff, I was expecting it to be dynamic, non-equilibrium, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. which is what I got of Rostow's theory of growth. Here I got all this equilibrium bloody algebra. And at the same time, I was studying university uh, mathematics with a brilliant lecture on calculus and differential equations and so on. And I thought how primitive economics was. And that's what really the was me breaking away from the neoclassicals. Um, and then going in the direction ultimately of post-Keynesian and what is fundamentally system dynamics. And when I look back on it, uh, Rostow's theory of growth was the sort of dynamic non-equilibrium system dynamics perspective that I expected to get at university and did not get. Yeah, yeah it dovetails. When I was at NYU um, getting my PhD, like they had said, oh, it used to be back in the day, you know, there was like a two sequence of history of economic thought. Then they made it one. Then it was optional. And then when I took it, Israel Kersner taught the course. You know, I, I caught him right before he retired and it was a master's level class. And I just took it like I'm, I'm here. Israel Kersner still teaching. I got to take something from me. Yeah, but it was, you know, other people were asking me, like, why are you wasting your time? You know, who, just just learn the cutting edge stuff. Who cares about people who taught economics poorly, you know, 100 years ago? just the mentality it shocked me that like they the, the students didn't like some of the, the best professors there they knew the history because on their own they just or they were older so they had that had been a requirement but the people getting phds in my cohort they didn't know the history of where the stuff came from they didn't you know cambridge controversy they didn't bother go reading that yeah and they have no idea of their own history too this is what i find quite remarkable like middle just like you i got into the history of economic thought and to give, give my initial um, foundation there. We had a brilliant lecturer at Sydney University called Ted Wheelwright, known as Red Ted, by the way. And uh, Wheelwright, he's also called a Mercedes-Benz socialist because he, the reason he drove a Mercedes-Benz was he was, seven, he was two metres tall. And the Mercedes-Benz made the only car he could get in without having to duck, duck his head while he was driving the car. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I think he was a Yorkshireman. Brilliant humour. And he took us through on a 27 lecture, one hour lecture a week, course he took us from fundamentally the physicocrats uh, mm. through to through to Keynes so that was my perspective and the, the thing which broke me away from the mainstream we'll have a bit of a chat about you and the Austrian thing as well as it was to go forward but I was very much rapidly neoclassical even though I was critical of the mathematics and um, and then a lecturer exposed me to the theory of the second best which I'm assuming you're familiar with mm -hmm. Okay, And that, of course, showed that if you were two steps from the neoclassical nirvana, so you had like a wage market with both unions and organised um, uh, employers, then if you abolish one or the other, you would make social welfare worse. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? Well, I had what they thought was, you know, a water take type case in favour of the free market, just, you know, individual workers but bargaining with individual employers. And suddenly you show me that if you start from the real world, which we know there are both unions and you know, employer groups, and you remove one another and you make it worse, there's something wrong with this theory. So I went down to the library, uh, you know, because there's nothing about that in my textbook, and I thought I better start, I don't trust the textbook anymore, that was the instant reaction. Mm -hmm. um, so I better start reading the journals, and as it happens, we were using Samuelson's textbook. And I saw an article by Samuelson in the 1966 edition of the Economic 
journal, and that was a summing up, which was his reaction to the Cambridge controversies. Right, right. Which, which also didn't turn up in his own textbook, of course. Um, so, you know, I began to think, well, you've got to know your history, otherwise you're going to be conned. And that's what I see with neoclassical. They have no bloody idea of their own history. They don't realise the essential they're conning not just themselves, but the rest of the world. Yeah, on that point, um, as I'm sure Ty knows, and, and maybe you did, I'm not a fan of Paul Krugman. And that was one of the things that really <laughs> bothered me is, is when uh, Piketty's book, you know, got big and then people were, it resuscitated, rekindled interest in the capital controversy. And uh -huh. Krugman just told his readers flat out, don't bother going. There's nothing there. You know, the, the, the neoclassicals won. It was like, no, oh, Samuelson, Almighty. he threw in the yeah. towel. Like he officially Absolutely. admitted. Absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, you can say, well, empirically, it's not a big, you know, you can argue it's not relevant empirically, you know, I disagree, but okay. But to just say, no, they, they were wrong. Like, it's no, if you go read it. It, it, show, it shows how little they know their own bloody history. Yeah, and that's yeah. what really pisses me off. They lecture guys like you and me. Like, we're opposite sides of the right, supposed right. political spectrum here. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know the history much better than the mainstream. And they lecture us and they're telling us that, you know, black is white. Yeah, well, yeah. screw you guys. Read some history and you realize we know what we're talking about and you do not. Also, I'd say, too, I found I was when I was at Hillsdale as a professor, I went there undergrad and then went back to teach. And, and yeah. they, they still had a history of economic thought uh, requirement for majors. And so I, that was what I was doing there. And even the textbook I was using, it, like I had to go to the source material, have the kids read that because even the, yeah. the best text I could find when it would summarize what somebody said in 1850 is like, no, that's not what the guy said. That's the opposite. Yeah. And, so it's it's tough. Like people who are trained in modern techniques, they can't help but see the world that way. And it's yeah. like, no, the people in eighteen hundred weren't thinking with your modern model. That's not how they were looking. So, well, I was lucky uh, in a weird sort of way. But this is this is a lot of fun talking about where we both came from, by the way. So, Ty, interrupt when you feel like it. But we're having a good time here. <laughs> um, I, uh, I I I started at the University of New South Wales in 1984 as a student doing a master's degree. And then in 87, I became on staff. And uh, there was a, just this ritual would happen where a, a staff member would resign one week before lectures started because if they left it that long, they got their holiday pay. Mm -hmm. So they'd say, oh, can somebody take this? It's keen. Can you do this course? And so I'd do this and I never got to start my PhD for years because of that. The one thing I got asked to take over was a course on Marxian and economics. And I was already a critic of critic and a fan of Marx at this stage. And then um, when I got to the University of Western Sydney sometime later, uh, they just had a, that was a very heterodox department, very post-Keynesian institutional department. And the guy had just designed a course on, or had a course on history of economic thought approved, but he hadn't yet started teaching it. So I got that course and exactly the same attitude you had. I, I read some of the texts that thought, like Mark Loud, for example, let's mm -hmm. say, that's that's not what Schumpeter said. You know? Right, right. That's not right. what Marx argued. Yeah, that's not yeah. what you know. So I, I said, all I can do is I'm going to give students original readings. So mm -hmm. I got I put together a three volume set of what I call ORF, original readings in economics and finance, and uh, and had the students reading through that over a uh, I think about a 18, 18 lecture series. And that's always been my foundation. If you don't know your history, you don't know your economics, and that wipes out. 90% of neoclassicals. Yeah, yeah. And, and their attitude like is, is, well, this is the cutting edge stuff. Why would we learn? And anyway, it's, it's interesting too. Like, it's why would you go into economics if that didn't interest you? Well, that surprises yeah. me too, but. Yeah, I mean, what, what they do, they, they, they build mistake upon mistake. And this is what, if you don't know your history, you don't, you don't know the previous fumble that you're extending right, the, right. the fumble forward. And it becomes a, I think a dog's breakfast is a lot more attractive than neoclassical economics. <laughs> so I I forgot to do the the list, Steve, at the beginning ah, of the show. Okay. It's gonna it's gonna be a your turn first because well, Mike and Dan aren't here. Um, this will uh, Bob. I'm gonna make you do this in the second hour. We try to pay homage to our viewers each week because they make this show. So we've got the top chatters, top commenters from last week. Steve, go ahead. Okay, Tony Wilson, Dreg Eye, Botched Mandela, Jonathan Lerman, Cobb Fan, Ghost on the Half Shell, WWE Fan 0104, Bob Liori, James James, Joe Polito, Capricious. That's a new one, I think. Tom Roberts, Jens Runberg, Paul LeBau, J Bay 088, Jovian R, The Atheist Paladin, Snurt Glitch. 
Are we getting Dutch pronunciations here? <laughs> Buster Beagle, the Libertarian, Michael de Souza Cruz, Manaharan, Basniat, William Turner, Warren Ellis, Lana Dell hates the clock. Hi, Lana. Kebob. This sounds like somebody from the Who. Uh, the Minstrel 55, Political Economy 101, Lost Adult. That sounds like me. I don't know, Lana Lost Old Man. Woody Pulpit 2000, Wayne McMillan, Apple Scab, and Leighton Watkins. <laughs> Good job. I think, Steve, you really do that well. That's probably the the professor educator and you just going through those names. It was nice. I actually put that together. I saw the libertarian there and I thought, OK, well, that's perfect. I haven't seen <laughs> seen that person. If you guys want to end up on that list, make sure you're chatting. I see it's a little bit slow right now. Um, but that's how I kind of derive that list. If you guys actually participate in the chat, I'm going to put you on that list or comment after the show. If you have any questions for either Bob or Steve, put them in there and uh, I'll relay them if I see them to either party. Um, I want to, I want to, let's, let's go to the elephant in the room. I'll declare I'm, I don't, I don't classify myself as an MM tier, um, but I appreciate some of the stock flow when, when godly approach they have. Bob, what are your general issues with MMT? Okay, sure. By the way, just this is probably the best time. To I thought all along that your handle on Twitter was just a complete. I thought you were saying thank you, Keynes. That's what I thought. That so now to realize it's Tyrone, K, like I'm kind of blown away. <laughs> yeah, hold um, on here. Hold on here. I don't know if this will show up here. Uh, cover up my uh, my address and stuff. Uh, that is it, me right there. Okay. Uh, driver's license. Okay. Tyrone yeah, Cairns. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so you had your name legally changed, such as your admiration <laughs> for the general theory. <laughs> the, the, after 2008, reading that book, yeah. I just, I thought, oh, what, what, what's, what's your, what's your father's name? Um, Bob Robert. <laughs> so <laughs> not Murphy. <laughs> So that that's, Keynes. that's a, Robert Keynes. Yeah, We're yeah, saying Robert yeah. Keynes. Okay. Okay. Right, yeah. Next time bring it. You want to really verify and get past Bob's little comment that you've got to show your father's driver license. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so Rob, yeah. Yeah. MMT. Okay. Sh sure. So yeah, I'll, I'll keep this brief and then, cause I know we'll probably unpack it. Um, I think the tendency is they will s s often say things that are true, like in terms of the accounting, whatever, like almost tautologies, but it's, I think it misleads the average person to believe it implies more about uh, the, the ability of the government to spend a bunch of money and there won't be ill consequences from that. Um, and, and so it's misleading, whether it's intentionally or not. That's, I guess that's my main gripe with the way MMTers are interacting with the public. I'll put it that way. Okay. That was pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, I mean, do you want me to so, elaborate or just or well, stop that? No, oh. you see, you've got the, it actually, the thing which is most intriguing to myself and Ty is that we take the accounting approach mm -hmm. to justifying MMT's logic. So are you saying you're pretty much okay with the accounting perspective? Well, well okay. So, for example, I'll, I'll do a quick one. So to say that, oh, um, you know, like a, a, a government debt is a net private sector asset. And so, you know, we, sh we shouldn't, don't worry about the, the government piling up debt because that's just private sector net assets. So I understand the accounting by which, you know, that's a true statement, you know, but I think though it's misleading because I, you know, I would say, okay, but it's a weird asset where if like the guy down the street owes me a thousand dollars and one of the ways he's going to pay me back is come up and stick a gun in my belly and say, give me a thousand dollars or else I'm going to throw you in a cage. Oh, here's the thousand dollars I owe you. So to me, that's a very that, strange that, type of asset. And that's why so they're the saying that the fact that you, the, the strength of the currency is the, is the, is the government can impose a taxation obligation. Right. That the way yeah. the government's going yeah. to service its debt yeah. is, you know, through ultimately the threat of cohort. It's whereas like a private company, if I have their bond, they have to go serve their customers and earn a profit to be able to pay me back. So, the, yeah. so that's I mean, why I, it's in, yeah. yeah. I mean, my perspective on that, that particular attitude to why money uh, has significance uh, and the state creation of money has significance, I find less appealing than simply saying 
uh, we have a agreed non-commodity basis for settling debts, whether they're private or public. And then, and that's what money does. And uh, the, the, the fundamental creation of money, if you go right back to, you know, the uh, Sumerian civilization and so on, it was basically a way of, of, of formalizing the system of interpersonal obligations we had in pre-industrial and pre-agricultural society. And so uh, the fact that it's money, I think money, even though the state didn't tax, and I'm, I'm actually a critic of income tax for all sorts of reasons, as a way of government taking money out of circulation, which is the MMT perspective and why they do tax. Um, but I think the, the fundamental thing that, that money does is enable uh, exchanges to occur. And you can have two ways of creating money. There's private banks can create it by, you know, I must ask you about what you think about the argument about banks creating money, by the way, because that's another point of contention with neoclassicals. So you okay about the concept that banks create money by uh, by lending? Uh, well, I guess I'll say some statements and you can. So I certainly the way the current system works, I agree that, yeah, if a bank wants to make a loan to somebody that that raises M1, and if you say M1 is part of the money stock, then yes, the bank created money. I don't like that system necessarily, but I agree that's how it is right now, if that's what you're asking. Well, that's the thing. I mean, what I find looking at a lot of Austrian uh, economists is they're saying, well, like everything about capitalism, except the banks can create money. And we think that bank money should actually be a commodity. Now, is that is that a reasonable caricature or an unreasonable caricature of an Austrian position? It, so it's ironic. That's actually the leading argument within card carrying Austrian circles is that, that we would call it the debate over fractional reserve banking. So See, this, yeah. and this, yeah. this is why I'm actually glad to have you on because you mm -hmm. as a particular Austrian, but also on our show, because what that implies to me is they say, well, like the free market for everything except money. Uh, because when you look at the how banks actually operate, this is why the accounting is so important to my, myself and Ty, uh, is that banks create money of double entry bookkeeping. They have an mm -hmm. asset which they can increase if they can find a willing borrower, then they increase their asset by creating a loan and they must increase their liability by the same amount and that's just the basic nature of double entry bookkeeping and that therefore means that if you have a monetary system if, with leaving the government out of it completely uh, it's going to be one in which the private sector can private banks can create money and that will not be based on a commodity and what i say a lot of austrians say oh we'd be better if we had capitalism based on commodity money and i think sorry guys Let's just describe the real world first of all before you talk about a way of improving it um, that you know that I think fundamentally could um, could end up making it dysfunctional. Okay, so yeah, let me. So they're the one group. So they're called um, free bankers. That's that's the term they go by. So yeah, they yeah. are endorse what you're saying, and they think yet yeah, a lot of them though do favor ultimate commodity money. Like this is before Bitcoin. But like as of 1990, a, a wing of the Austrian school liked wanted gold. Like they said, if there was no government intervention in money and banking, the market still would have thought, you know, gold and silver would be the ultimate base money. And then banks would be able to issue notes that were, you know, airtight claims on that. And that would circulate as money in the broader sense. Or sometimes they would call, you know, they did it, like they call it outside money versus inside money. Um uh, and then, but then that some, especially like the tradition of Murray Rothbard, they wanted 100% reserves. But they, it, it wasn't that they would so much wanted the government to enforce it. Is they said, oh, it's because of FDIC and you know implicit promises that the that the Fed's going to bail out the banks if they get caught with their pants down and stuff. That so they're saying the reason reserve ratios aren't 85% or higher is because the system is there to like help the banks and that if there was a genuine free market then reserve ratios in the real world would be a lot higher so that that's the argument okay uh, Ty. by the way my wife's got Ty, Ty tv going in the background that's the noise you're picking up on the microphone so i feel quite free to mute me when i'm not talking at least when i talk i can overwhelm the the Ty commentary in the background um yeah i think this this is what, what a point of a point of unrealism about the austrian perspective and that's one reason why i never uh, for, uh, you know, I, I read some Austrian work and I never, it never particularly excited me because I found it unrealistic. It, and the, the, the further more work I've done in the banking system, the more I think it is unrealistic because 
um, you know, fundamentally money comes down to double entry bookkeeping. And uh, if, what you're banning, we want to ban double entry bookkeeping. And okay, but that isn't describing the existing system when I think the first thing we should do is be able to describe capitalism as it actually functions. And I think that's a sort of a mythical side um, to uh, the Austrian perspective uh, that, that I just wish they'd abandoned because you know the, you know the Austrian who doesn't believe that, of course. Well, hey, I mean, just to Schumpeter. clarify. Schumpeter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, so even the people like in the hardcore 100% reserves is like the best system. They agree with the accounting that you're talking about. They, they, what they're, the argument is if you had a system of genuinely free market commercial banks who are issuing, you know, notes or nowadays, you know, electronic claims, mm. on, and let's say gold is the underlying actual base money, just for the sake of argument that, um, you know, they, the banks in equilibrium have to keep reserve, some reserves, even if there's no regulations, you know, requiring it. And that if one, any one bank tried to inflate more rapidly, like extending more loans than its rivals over time through clearing operations, the, the gold reserves in their vaults would get drained into their competitors. And so no one bank can expand too rapidly relative to its peers. And so the argument is if banking were genuinely free entry and there wasn't like a cartel, then even if the existing banks all started inflating, someone would just start a new one with a higher reserve ratio and all the gold would flow into their vaults. So you and can that, disagree that's what, empirically, but that, that, that's the argument. Yeah, that's one thing I think quite fantastical because what it's saying is if you had a bank offering you a higher rate of return, you'd go to a lot of the bank because you know it's more stable. And like, frankly, if you look at people's behaviour, and this is the whole, you know, um, you know, the the what's that wonderful uh, statement from? I've forgotten the title of the book all, all of a sudden, but uh, Charles Mackay's uh, you know, exuberance yeah, know from the mean, yeah. madness of crowds. Mm -hmm. um, if people saw a massive return, they all dived in. And what rather than having like you get rid of the bad banks, which is part of the attitude I see coming out of that particular version or strand of Austrian thought, you'd have booms and busts just like we had in the 18th, 19th century when people would dive into the bank offering the highest return. People would forget uh, the little you like. I think you'll appreciate this little story. I gave a presentation on my model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis in my very first weeks at the University of Western Sydney way back in 96 or thereabouts. And I walked out, one of my colleagues who's semi-Austrian, his attitude is, you know, Steve, the difference between you and me is I believe people learn from their mistakes. And I said, yes, Andrew. And the other difference between you and me is I believe people forget and die. <laughs> yeah. And, so, I, and I think that's, there's a, there's right. a potential which you have an unrealistic attitude about humanity that they would not forget and they would not, well, maybe not die, but they'd always tell their kids. And I think we just forget we'd be in a boom bust cycle people diving into high return banks, banks falling and so on. It's, you know, yeah. I think it's, I think it's naive. And that's I, I, the last thing we need is more naive economics after a century and a half of neoclassicals. Right. So I, let me confess, uh, if you had talked, talked to me as of 2007 and asked me how big of systemic mistakes do you think like these private investment bankers and stuff would do? And then when I saw what happened, I, I was surprised. Right. So I can still say um, I agree that like, so the, the Austrian take even for the free bit or the hundred you know, percent reservist crowd is they would say, okay, but if you ask people right now, like you said, Steve, Oh, this, you know, this checking accounts offering me a higher rate of return. I'll, I'll park my money there. And if somebody said, but have you looked at their portfolio? Like they're investing in, you know, risky mortgages and whatever, whereas this bank over here, they have much more uh, stable assets. But right now people say, well, there's FDIC. I don't care what, you know, I, I look at what, what's the checking fees they charge me. I don't, I don't care what the bank puts its money in because the government guarantees it all. So the argument, no, I, I agree that there were booms and busts even before the 1930s when, you know, that was introduced in the U.S. But um, again, th that's the idea that competition can't possibly work or like with the recent housing bubble and boom, if the people that were risky and didn't pay attention to obvious things got bailed out, well, then that kind of neuters the market's ability to punish people. But, you, but you're right. I, when I was younger, I wouldn't have thought it true, but now I've seen it with my own eyes that it is true. People on Wall Street, if they haven't lived through a crash, they just can't believe it's coming and until they live through it. And then they're wiser until, you know, the next generation, watch out. This is getting into a bubble. 
and they don't believe it because they haven't lived through it. So n- now I've seen it with my own eyes, but yeah. I've got, I got everybody muted here. Sorry, Steve, I muted you because you had that Thai episode. So, so interesting. Uh, I'm guessing it's a soap opera. Let's uh, kind of shifts in uh, something that I'm interested in is the, the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Um, tell me, um, educate me a little bit on it and the viewers. How does that work? What is the theory behind it? You know, elaborate. Okay. Can I ask, are you guys hearing that lawnmower or not? I cannot hear. Okay, you okay. so I don't need to close the window. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I'm hearing mm-hmm. it. it's coming through. Okay, um, yeah, so this was a theory uh, developed by Ludwig von Mises um, in the book that's now translated as The Theory of Money and Credit is the English title they gave it, uh, 1912 it came out. So he, the basic explanation is he thought that, um, kind of tying into what we're, what we're talking about here a minute ago, that because the, loosely speaking, the, yeah, the commercial banks, can lend out money that hasn't been pri- saved previously in, in, the, in the, the sense of like if there's a hard money that yeah there is some flexibility and they can extend loans even if there haven't been you know more gold or silver brought into their vaults that that is like a loose joint and so there's a sense in which the market rate of interest gets pushed below what he was calling the natural rate you know barring on a concept from the excel and so like if, if the natural rate is supposed to be the one that kind of equilibrates genuine saving with investment and then their actual market rate of interest gets pushed below because of this uh, credit expansion, then that interest rate is wrong. It's, it's too low. It's artificially low. It's giving a wrong signal. And then entrepreneurs start longer processes than there are available physical capital goods to carry to completion. And that so it, it's a, a boom period. It seems... Everybody seems like it's prosperous. Businesses are bidding workers away from each other. Wages are rising. Everybody feels great, but it's built on quicksand. It's unsustainable physically. And then at some point, the banks chicken out. They, they you know, tighten credit, and then it turns, and there's a big crash. And workers have to get laid off because all those lines are unsustainable. Like the economy has to regroup, as it were, and then you know, channel workers and other resources to more sustainable roles. And in that intervening period, everybody realizes we're not as wealthy as we thought we were a year ago. And so it's very painful and, and that's the bust. But in the Austrian view, that's the necessary correction to the false euphoria of the boom. Steve, your thoughts on the business cycle? Hey, I'll just ask you to ask, is that seen as an overall creative process though, Bob? Or is it just a, like something which would be better if that cycle didn't happen? Uh, I... Th- I think saying it would be uh, if interest rates, if there wasn't credit expansion and there was just genuine, uh, they would be better if if that cycle didn't happen, that you would still get entrepreneurship and innovation. But the market, if the interest rate was always the correct price, that would just be better for everybody. That would just, it would do its job better to coordinate information. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you a history of economic thought question. Have you read Schumpeter's theory of economic development? I read parts of it, but no, I have not read the thing cover to cover. Okay, yeah. I would highly recommend you read that because mm-hmm. what you'll find in, in Schumpeter, uh, in that, like I, I've got to confess, I first read Schumpeter way back in 1972 or three, I think. I said, a, a, this is by Ted Wilwright, he said an essay where you had to take a book and write a critique of it, which was a fabulous essay. Uh, and I chose Capitalism, Social and Democracy by Joseph Schumpeter, and I was bored shitless. <laughs> I thought it was a waste of space, uh-huh. and I was very critical of the book itself, and I, I end up regarding it as being just his way of making some retirement income because it was a popular book. And he actually literally talked the same sort of Keynes about the effect of the euthanasia of the Rontier, and I thought it was never going to happen, just silly stuff like that. So I ignored Schumpeter right until 1990s, seven or eight, and I got asked to teach a course in managerial economics, at the University of Western Sydney. I thought, well, everybody in managerial uses Schumpeter, so I better read him again. Mm-hmm. And I got a hold of capitalism, social, so I got a hold of theory of economic development. And I was stunned, honestly stunned. That was his mm-hmm. fundamental PhD thesis, because whenever I've read any uh, major economist, this includes Marx and Keynes, I'll find, and, 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 and Ricardo and Malthus and Smith, I'll find them making a verbal argument of some sort, which I can see a logical flaw in how they deduce from that logical verbal argument further on in their arguments. 
like labor theory of value by Marx, for example. I read the whole damn thing and I Schumpeter did not make, in my opinion, one mistake in his own logical, which was mm -hmm. remarkable. One of the great advantages of mathematical discipline is that if you make a mathematical error, you can find it. Now, you might not want to find it, but you can find it, or a critic can. Um, but Schumpeter really argued for a very convincing argument of the, of the reason that a cycle occurs. So his logic was that if you have a, um, he said in, in capitalism, taking a Walrasian perspective, and he was respectful of Walras because he couldn't do mathematics, Schumpeter couldn't do mathematics himself, mm -hmm. been intimidated by those who could. Um, so he said, if you have a Walrasian system, then the rate of profit is zero. And his logic was fundamentally marginal revenue arguments. So if you pay the workers their marginal product and you pay, if you rent the, the machinery and you pay the machinery manufacturer their marginal product, then there's no surplus yet for you. So he said profit must be a disequilibrium phenomenon. And therefore, what you have is a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur will come up with a new way of uh, producing something which disrupts the productive system. So let's say the example I used with the... Um, the spinning jenny. So the first machine, like you do spinning wheels, one worker per wheel, and then the spinning jenny is invented, and one worker can spin six wheels. And he said, what that means is you're then going to have a increase in productive uh, capacity later on. But he said the way that it happens is that um, he imagined, first of all, a fully employed economy. So there's no idle resources to be used, and an entrepreneur with a good idea and no money, which is my situation, frankly, um, but, it, but it's more realistic than saying here's a corporation which already has money. So they said to get the money, they've got to borrow it from a bank. And therefore, the creation of money by the bank, and he literally used that phrase, creation of money by the bank enables the entrepreneur to buy resources away from existing enterprises, pay more for workers, pay more for capital. And then that enables the entrepreneur to turn the idea into something concrete Causes a boom while it happens for obvious reasons. You've added more money, you've bid up wages and profits and so on. Uh, and then you have a, uh, you said, then what you have after that, when the product comes into existence, you have a downturn because, first of all, the uh, entrepreneur is paying back their part of their debt. So there's a reduction in the money supply. But secondly, this product comes in and undercuts the existing um, producers and therefore causes a slump in those. So you, you got to, that's what I think is a really good Austrian theory of the business cycle. And I think the one you've given, the main one you've largely uh, contributed, may say, we get the price right, then we know the cycle. Well, you know, that's almost neoclassical in my way of thinking, and I'm not particularly fond of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just a couple of responses. So to be clear, um, you know, standard Austrian, so especially in the tradition of, you know, Mises, um, Israel Kirzner's, you know, taught, would learn from him and his big, whole careers like an entrepreneurship and whatnot so certainly any individual firm you know entrepreneurs are going to make bold conjectures and start things and it might flop and that company goes bankrupt and that's you know necessary in a healthy economy you know there has to be unemployment at any given time otherwise people aren't taking enough risks you know things like that but the issue of why is this this cluster of errors why is it that it seems like not just you know randomly distributed every year a certain amount of businesses fail, but it seems like it comes in waves. That's the thing that, you know, Mises was trying to explain. And he thought it's because the banks systematically occasionally give the wrong, you know, incentives or signals. And that causes a problem. And it would be better in the long run if it was just more of a consistently accurate feedback about here's the state of genuine saving. So. Well, and in fact, Sean Pater has an explanation for that. So I really am saying for your own pleasure, you'd thoroughly enjoy it. Trust yeah. me, you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, read, read theory of economic development because what he argues is that again he says the reason you get clusters is because the first entrepreneur who succeeds at something then leads to other entrepreneurs thinking they'll go into the same bandwagon so if you look at the growth I mean, the, the classic example in our recent history i think is in a genuine sense is the development of the internet in the 1990s mm -hmm. and the building out of the optical fiber uh, 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 infrastructure now, once somebody got a loan for, for optical fiber and developed the technology and showed higher transmission rates and so on, then you got hurting on two levels. You got hurting from entrepreneurs, other ones wanting to bring optical fiber in as well, and you also got hurting from the banks. And this is a great, a great friend of ours, Richard Vague. We haven't had Richard Vague on the show yet, have we, Ty? We, no. we must have him on. Richard was a banker and very successful one in Texas and said he saw hurting in terms of loans by Texan banks to oil rig 
you know, during the, the 79 oil price boom. So you get hurting on both sides. And so that's the explanation for it. So it's not a case to get the price right. Uh, you'll still get the hurting occurring because one entrepreneur's success makes it easier for others to get success. And one banker's success in financing it mean other bankers go and finance the same. The cycles will still occur. Okay, the interest rates are not going to work in regulating that that uh, rate of investment. Okay, yeah, I mean, I guess at the very least, I would say, um, and I should mention, yeah, for a, a client years ago, wanted me to go do research, and I was reading Schumpeter, and then I think the pandemic hit. To be honest, and then we got I got shunted off that and doing something else. But you're right; it's never that I got to a point in his discussion where I thought, "Oh, that's wrong." It was just a, a different you know narrative, and like I said, it got aborted before I got through the, the meat of it. But um, yeah, so, and this is kind of going back to what I was saying 10 minutes ago. If you had talked to the 2007 version of me, I would have been more, no, as long as, you know, the prices are correct, da, 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 da. and now I, I am more open to like fads and herding. And I, but still though, I would say, okay, when the herding happens and when the, the new fad comes on, if interest rates are 1%, there's a lot more silliness that gets funded than if they were at 6%, you know, th th that kind of thing. So at the very least, I think the guardrails would be tighter. And certainly if people knew if this fails, the whole system goes down, there's no central bank to come in and bail everybody out. Like you're on your own. I think that would cause more discipline and prudence, but yes, obviously there's still mob psychology within those constraints. Discipline and prudence are not two words I'd use to describe the American culture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the problem. There's, there's an extent to which there's an idealised version of the human in the Austrian perspective of how things would work if you didn't have government behaviour. And that's what I see as being naive again. I mean, um, you know, herding has been something which has been part of humanity's behaviour for its history. And this is partly why we've been successful as a species, because we are the only species that can just effectively decide to herd. Now, others herd for evolutionary reasons. We herd because we think it's a good idea at the time. And sometimes it is, and other times it leads to booms and busts. And I think that's what uh, we have to try to capture in the real world is the, is the genuine boom-bust cycle. Uh, and like the thing, the thing what I, I, what I come back to, you worry about the rate of interest. I worry about the level of private debt. And the reason I was, the 2007 me uh, was very confident there's going to be a crisis in 2007 and called it out and stuck my neck out very vividly, visually, um, is because of there's too much private debt. And that's ignored by both neoclassical and Austrian schools of economics. Whereas post Keynesian coming largely out of Minsky and Fisher, not so much out of Keynes, worries about the private debt being too high and, and that causing the booms and busts. And I think, again, the Austrians worry too much about the government side and not enough about private sector. And one thing I would want to do is, is control and reduce the extent to which banks can create money um, uh, when that creates the, the, the financial bubbles and particularly bubbles in asset prices. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just clarify just to make sure um, when I keep alluding to what my 2007 self thought, I had an article at the time, if people want to look it up called, you know, Robert Murphy, the worst recession in 25 years, question mark. And so using standard Austrian business cycle theory in the summer of 07, I was worried that we were going to have a big crash and the last time that the interest rates were this artificially low was the late 70s. And hence, I thought the next recession is going to be as bad as the early 80s. And so it wasn't that I thought everything was rosy, but I'm just saying after the crash, the more research I did and talking to people like that were pricing the mortgage backed securities and things and talking and just saying, why were you giving them triple A and, and just and hearing what the real reasons were like, I don't know, there were these quants down the hall and they all had PhDs in physics and they told us. So we were selling that stuff and, you know, realizing like, wow, that wasn't very good quality control, <laughs> but I'm just saying, so I knew this, the system was in a bad spot, but just the, how uh, reckless the individuals were, which I didn't realize till after the fact that surprised me. Bob, can you uh, send that article you did um, in the private chat and that yeah. way I can post it in the uh, main chat. Everybody would think I wasn't bluffing. Off. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't seem to find it. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to take away from my conversation. I want to listen to what Steve's saying. I'll send it to you later. 
<laughs> Everybody watching on X, uh, make sure you hit the like button, repost, formerly known as Twitter, whatever name you choose to refer to that social media site as now. And then come over here, join the chat on YouTube at the Prof Steve Keen YouTube channel. Hit the like button here, comment, have some fun. Now, I kind of, I didn't want this to turn into a debate, but I did go to chat G- GPD. Um, and I asked uh, Chad, I, I asked it, um, give me challenging debate questions or wh- give me debate questions that challenge Austrian economics. And I said five. And I also put in, give me uh, a d- debate questions challenging Keynesian economics. So this is how I derived uh, these questions, because for one, I wanted Bob to feel like this was unbiased. So, yeah, I'm I, I'm. I'm under Steve Keen. I follow him. You know, he's done a lot for me. That's obvious. But I wanted to have questions that weren't biased to one or the other. And we did this with John Hearn a few weeks ago. And I asked the same question um, to both John and Steve. And I realized I needed unique questions to ask. And then, so if I ask Bob a question, then Steve can reply to what Bob says about it. Then when I ask Steve a question... Bob can reply. Um, And we'll try to just keep this. They're easy questions. So keep it two minutes or less, just so we can cover the differences between Keynesian and Austrian economics. I'll bring up the first one for Bob. Is is the Austrian emphasis on methodology and individualism overly reductionist? Bob, what can you say on that question? Okay, so the way, you know, the uh, emphasis on that in the classics, like the work of Mises in particular, I think it was entirely appropriate because there he really is trying to establish, you know, economics as a science and to distinguish it from some of the other, you know, sociology and what other things that were currents that were going on, you know, even in Vienna and stuff at the time. So I get why he put the emphasis on it. And I think it's entirely correct and appropriate, you know, in his work. Uh, what, what I do see, though, where I think it's silly is it sort of spills out into the broader, you know, free market libertarian world and people will do things like um, ignore the fact that, or like they'll say stuff like I think even there's a famous Margaret Thatcher quote about, like to say society doesn't exist and stuff like that or to say or I've even seen it where some libertarians will say, oh, I don't like team sports. I only like you know, singles tennis or, so you know, the goofy things because I'm a, an individual. And so there, obviously that's just a complete, you know, a butchering of what the concept was. And certainly you can be a methodological individualist and still acknowledge, Oh, sometimes people, when they're in a crowd, like, you know, lynching someone, they may do things that they never would have done if they were alone. And that's not a violation of methodological individualism for me to say stuff like that. All right. Okay. So I'll get Steve. Steve, what's your your thoughts on on the question and what Bob said? Oh, sorry. I'll unmute you, Steve. It's that yeah, thank, so I, I, thank you. Okay. The point that I start from is actually I can take a quote from Marx to emphasize it, and that is: men make their own history, but not at times and circumstances that they're own choosing. The, they make it uh, with times and circumstances endowed to them with the past. And what that means is both the history of the society in which you're in and the structure of that society control your behavior, constrain your behavior, even if you are trying to be the classic Ayn Randian individual. So um, I would, and I think what we've had is an an excessive focus, and this is from both Austrians and neoclassicals, on methodological individualism. You'll know, Bob, I'm sure, that uh, you can find a a strong quote in favor of methodological individualism somewhere where you both uh, knock one Paul Krugman. He gave a talk to uh, evolutionary biologists and made a, basically made the proposition that methodological individualism is of the essence. Well, I think that's what's actually misled the neoclassicals completely uh, because they, they started starting from a subjective definition of the theory of value. They found it impossible to aggregate and therefore they're things like a supply curve and so on. They can, they can derive one for an individual quite easily, but they cannot derive one for the market. So the methodological individualism is what led them to make all sorts of bizarre, stupid assumptions about the real world, which is why economics is in this incredibly bad state that it is now. So I think we need less emphasis upon the on the individual and more emphasis upon understanding the structure of the economy you're in and then how that structure constrains and shapes behavior. 
All right, we're just going to keep rolling just to try to cover all the things we can cover. This one is a Keynesian question for you, and then Bob can reply. Does Keynesian economics rely too heavily on government intervention, potentially leading to physical uh, irresponsibility and excessive public debt? Your thoughts, Steve? Okay. Uh, first thing I'd actually so there's a sense to which I agree with that statement, uh, because if you uh, because if you take a look at one of the impacts of the uh, the growth in the government sector after the Second World War and after the Great Depression. If you go back to the uh, to the 19, early 1900s and the late 1800s, you can find periods where the level of government spending in the America was less than 5% of GDP. Uh, so in that sense, 19th century, America is the closest thing we had to free market capitalism. And only after the, um, the, first, world, the, first, the first World War, then it fell back to pretty much pre-war levels. Then the Great Depression rose substantially, and then even more in the Second World War. And then after that, we've had government being about five times the scale as a percentage of GDP to what it was in the uh, the pre-war, pre-1900s uh, period. And what that has meant is that the government's uh, counter-cyclical behaviour, whether it wants to do it or not, has had a dominant impact on the behavior of the economy compared to the free market world of the 19 of the, of the 1800s uh, now that's had some good sides to it uh, because with far less recessions far less downturns than um, than we had in the 1800s uh, and far less you know uh, the bearings bank and other crashes like that were a, a 10 to 15 year occurrence in the 1800s they're far less frequent in the 19 in the 1900s but what what it's also allowed is the runaway level of private debt so a large part of the increase in private debt we've seen is because the government's bailed out the system when it's had too much of a debt bubble uh when the 1800s you look at it and as well as some ridiculous decisions by the government to try to reduce its debt you also had periods where uh private sector debt crashed and the aftermath reduced the level of private debt and you could go back to a reasonably financially sensible private sector uh, but the um, the um, uh, post World War II period, uh, what the government has underdone, uh, effectively un done unconsciously, is un underwrite an enormous growth in the financial sector, and so they've helped create financial capitalism. One of the main things I object to. And now we will now bring on Bob. Bob, Bob uh, this isn't my wheelhouse uh, doing debates here. This mm -hmm. is something new. So, pardon me for being a bad moderator. But what's your response um, to what Steve just said? Um, I, so I certainly agree with the, that the government slash central bank has encouraged like the financialization of the economy. That I, I agree that I don't think that that sector, you know, the financial sector would be as big a share of GDP in a free market. So I, I agree with that. Um, I, I would quibble. I guess the one thing he said that I think I definitely disagree with is um, my understanding it like Larry White and some co-authors have a paper arguing that um, the finance, the stability, economic stability of the U.S. was higher before the Federal Reserve than after. Um, and so I, you know, I, I would quibble with that. Uh, but other than that, yeah, my, again, kind of going back to what I said earlier, that to me, government, if you're coming from the framework, we're thinking in general, resources getting allocated through markets is just more efficient and you know better catering to genuine consumer wants than having political influence. The, the scope of the government, just that distorts things in the long run. And so, that, you know, the government borrowing money and then allowing that to fuel excessive spending that like part of the issue is like, what's the big deal that yeah it's it's channeling resources in a way that i think is less likely to you know help human welfare gotcha so we got the next question here chat gpt wow you got does the rejection of mathematical modeling limit the explanatory power of austrian economics okay yeah so i know you want to keep these snappy um so i think um if you understand, I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding of what the Austrian take is on this. And admittedly, it's partly because some of the people who call themselves Austrians, especially if they're like just fans in the trenches and they're not actually professional economists, may say things that maybe would disagree with the take I'm going to give right now. So I think Mises, for example, you know, when he was laying out what he thought was economic law, laws that, you know, that that was a priori and you just think through the implications of it to say like the law of diminishing marginal utility 
that wasn't it didn't involve empirical you know conditions that you didn't go have to run uh regression analysis to come up with stuff like that or even like the the standard case for free trade if you go read you know bastiat or whatever a lot of that's or you know henry hazlitt it's more just like thinking about it a certain way and then oh yeah it's not well, this country, they liberal, they lowered tariffs, and then let's go and see what happened to you know measures of consumer welfare. That's not the, the way the argument works. So in terms of just the framework and coming up with tendencies to say, oh, these are causal forces, and then in the real world, in a messy situation, just to give an example, so I can know, oh, I think the central bank might cause a boom-bust cycle. I think raising the minimum wage too aggressively might cause unemployment. To say, why did unemployment go up so much in 2009? It, you know, was it just the minimum? What that's an empirical question. There, you can use mathematical modeling even to be an Austrian to try to come up with here's my judgment as to what effect was what. But in terms of the underlying laws, that's what more a priori, like like geometric proofs in the in the Misesian framework. Hmm. Okay, look, I'm yeah, I'm I'm a critic of neoclassical mathematical modeling and a fan of mathematical modeling. So I think this is the um, uh, the problem, if you look at the, uh, if there's reasons that Menger gave for being anti-mathematical reasoning, that was largely forcing equilibrium on the model, on the system to be able to do the modeling in the first place, which is all you really could do in the, you know, the late uh, 1800s. Uh, whereas, uh, and what neoclassical has done is continue to do that with even more stylized mathematics. And they keep on running into logical conundrums. So like, the, um, I'm pretty certain you're aware of the sonnenstein mantel de Broer theorem, and that means you can't derive a market demand curve out of out of the idea of individual having you know, downward sloping market demand curves. Uh, and equally, that's the uh, uh, Peron Frobenius theorem, meaning that Balra's uh, equilibrium process of Tadema does not converge to equilibrium. So those sorts of errors led to what I call not mathematics by neoclassical economists, but mythematics. They simply make ridiculous logical illogical assumptions to jump over logical conundrums and then they've got themselves caught in a bizarre form of, 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 of so apparent mathematical logic which is based on making ludicrous assumptions and then seeing what follows from those ludicrous assumptions so i'm much more a fan of, of, of system dynamics nonlinear differential equations that sort of approach to modeling and that's what's uh, you know, that would enable me to see the financial crisis coming before it hit, um, that's what uh, you know, Forrester tried to bring into economics and was pushed out by Nordhaus. So I'm a fan of mathematics, not what neoclassical economists have done. And I think Austrians uh, have hobbled themselves by not taking advantage of being able to do modeling of complex systems. You remember from Hayek's uh, Nobel Prize speech, she talks about how complexity made it impossible to model mathematically. Shortly after that speech, we learned that complexity doesn't mean complicated. It means three or more nonlinear systems interacting. All right, next question. We'll have a little bit of time to suss out some of these where there's divisions among both of you a little more at the end of the questions. This one, I kind of left the same. It, uh, this is chat GPT not knowing um, everything and it's uh, the Phillips curve. So maybe you can give some insight. Is the Phillips curve a reliable tool for pol policymakers or does it oversimplify the relationship between inflation and unemployment? Keep in mind, I've read the papers. I know you've read the papers. So what do you got to say there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, as you and I both know, Phillips had effectively a three-dimensional, uh, he didn't have a curve, he had a surface and he had uh, inflation, it was starting fundamentally from the idea that a high level of economic demand meant that productive factors, labor capital and resource producers could all charge higher prices. And this is basically seeing a, a competitive struggle over the distribution of income. Uh, and, this, and the higher the level of employment was, the more power that gave to workers and resource of raw materials producers than it gave to manufacturers. And that's a very realistic starting point. And then Phillips, if you read, if you, if you and I have both read the original Phillips paper uh, on uh, on unemployment and money wages, he also included workers reacting to the change in the level of unemployment. So if you had a rising level of unemployment, that would dampen wage demands. And if you had a falling level of unemployment, that would, that would boost wage demands, even though, you know, the initial situation with the unemployment rate might have the opposite effect. And then cost of living adjustments. 
uh, through imported inflation fundamentally. So Phillips's vision was much, much richer. And the real, the real problem with Phillips' curve was, and Phillips himself admitted this you know, very uh, unhappily later in life, he said he wouldn't have done the Phillips curve if he knew how it would be used. Uh, and what he, he, he did actually write in that paper the idea of a menu. If you wanted uh, uh, stable prices, you could have 5% unemployment. And if you wanted uh, stable income shares, you would have wanted 3% unemployment. And that implied there was a menu, which was a huge mistake because he actually built it as part of a system dynamics model. And there would never have been uh, equilibrium anywhere along that curve unless you had other policies trying to hold the unemployment rate and the inflation rate at that level. <coughs> Bob will bring in just to let everybody know. I'm just going to put Bob's uh, link to his article in the chat a few times over the next few minutes. Make sure you click on it, bookmark it, bookmark it, read it after the show because I got I don't want you guys to go leave, uh, leave and read Bob's stuff now. I want you to watch the show. Bob, what can you say on the Phillips curve? Sure. So I agree with Steve that when I went went back and and I didn't read it covered, but I, I did go and look at like the original thing, and I thought, oh. Because, because as you can imagine, in the free market Austrian, you know, libertarian type tradition of economics, we're taught to hate the Phillips curve, and oh, that's still it was discredited by the stagflation of the seventies, and uh, and so when I went back and reread it, how it was money weight, like it was much more reasonable in his original presentation than what it turned into, in my view. So uh, this is, you know, it's I feel bad for the guy that sort of the thing named after him got used in a way that I and I didn't know Steve that he wasn't happy with how it uses, but that, that doesn't surprise me. So I guess my quick take, uh, Ty is the, um, so given my view of what causes the business cycle, I understand this correlation where in practice, like if there's an inflationary boom that causes high inflation and then low unemployment, and then when the, everything tightens, the banks tighten, then there's a crash and unemployment goes up and that tends to, you know, bring down, at least the growth in prices, if not absolute level. So I could see why there would be this correlation, but that's just because of, you know, it, it's not a direct causal thing that if, in my view, if you just had stable money throughout, then once expectations got re you know, calibrated, then there would be no trade off. And it, you know, you could have very stable prices or even gently falling prices and low unemployment with, you know, without these wild swings. And so that, all of a sudden it would seem like the curve fell apart. Whereas I would just say it's because that curve was just due to other things causing something that then caused this correlation. You're, you you're muted something. to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I said our one big happy family. It's kind of lost <laughs> now that it was, Muted. So the next question I'm going to skip because it's about the the Austrian business cycle. We covered that I think in in great depth. So I'm just going to delete that. One. I'll skip. Uh, delete the next Keynesian one too, just so we can get through this. What do we got here? Okay, here's here's a good one, Bob. Does the focus on subjectivism and marginal utility adequate adequately uh, address the issues of inequality and distribution of wealth, Bob? Okay. Um, again, I know you want these to be snappy, so I'll try to be brief. So uh, there is a tendency. Yeah. So like a real hardcore, and I've done this, I'm not like casting. I've, I've done this myself, like just to make sure do people understand like, Hey, the diminishing marginal utility thing, strictly speaking says, yes, the thousandth dollar to a given man means less than the 500th dollar to that same person. It doesn't necessarily mean that the thousandth dollar to this guy means less than the $500 to that guy over there. And in fact, that statement's nonsensical in the original, like at least in the Austrian view of what utility means that it doesn't even make sense to say, Oh, does this guy get more utils from that than this guy over here would that that's a nonsense statement because you know, ultimately preferences are ordinal and there's no way. Okay. So that's like the hard line approach. But having said that though, people would say, you know, David Friedman's raised objections like this to like, come on, I got, if I got kids in my house and I know, you know, oh, we could go to this place and half the kids would like it. We could go here and you can do things as a parent that you understand like the way it will impact the kids and you kind of make intersubjective utility comparison. So I get that too. And I guess I would just say strictly speaking, even though the words might be the same, it's different. Just like the word work in physics means one, like I, if I'm holding a rock 
out like this and just holding it there. I'm not doing any work in terms of physics, but like, oh, wow, this is a lot, you know, this is a lot of effort I'm expending and my arm's getting sore. So I, it's that kind of a thing. Gotcha. Steve, your thoughts, marginal utility, go ahead. First of all, I actually said copying in the, in the private chat a reference I'd like Bob to take a look at on Phillips. He's a far more richer human being than uh, most people realize, a remarkable person. Give you an idea how remarkable he was. He was in a prisoner of war camp in the Japanese during the Second World War, and he broke into the commandant's office and stole components to make a radio so that he could broadcast to the inmates what was actually happening in the war as opposed to the Japanese propaganda they were being fed. It takes courage and it takes intelligence. And that's something that I would not accuse most neoclassical economists <laughs> of having. Okay? Uh, so well worth knowing. I, I think the subjectivism is the error in neoclassical economics and, and Austrian as well. That's why I see them as having a shared erroneous foundation because what they give you, you start from a subjective foundation or theory of value. And yet what we actually are living on is a planet which we're exploiting its physical physical resources and producing physical things as part of it. And we have to understand that physical uh, foundation from which we begin. And the, the problem with uh, standard post-Keynesian approaches and Keynesian approaches as well is that they refuse to have a theory of value. After what they saw in terms of the value wars between Marxists and Austrians and neoclassicals in the, in the, 18, in the, uh, in the 1800s. So what I've ended up with, and this, this actually I started with this fundamentally, in reading Marx, I found that Marx had an objective theory of value, but not the labor theory of value. And using that objective theory of value, you contradict the labor theory of value, first of all. So you prove that uh, all surplus does not come from labor, but surplus can be generated in, Mar in Marx's sense, surplus can be generated from any input into production. So there's no tendency for the rate of profit to fall. That stuff goes by the wayside. But it also means that at some points you can have a subjective theory of value. So when you look at, for example, new technology and new products being produced, then they are the, the large part of the demand coming out of that comes from people who think that's really cool stuff and I want that shit soon and are willing to pay a high price for it. But ultimately, once it comes to a standard part of the input-output process of manufacturing, uh, those, those that, that early adopter stuff isn't any, there anymore and the sale price is determined largely by its cost of production. So I think we need a, a theory of value which enables to have both objective and subjective levels. By starting at subjective, the neoclassicals couldn't do it. By starting at objective, but having an idea of a dialectic, and Marx's dialectic is much different to what most people think Marx's dialectic is, is that you create subjective levels where they're necessary, like in the valuation of financial assets and in the valuation of new products. And that's the foundation we should be using rather than starting from strict subjectivity or being stuck in objectivity as the labor theory of value is with no chance of escape. Nice. So I'm, I'm not going to do any more questions. I've gotten bored of doing this debate thing. It's, this is boring. Bob, really what I want to know, because I, I gave, I gave little time to answer. Were, were there parts there that you wanted to kind of elaborate more on some of those questions? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember now. Um, so I, I guess, it, let me just state what the, the standard Austrian view is on that stuff. And then, you know, I don't know if Steve is disagreeing with that or, or saying I'm just, there's something else that we're overlooking. So the standard view, like with subjective value, and then how does that lead to objective market valuation is, you know, real, so I'm, a guy sells me a used car, I give him $5,000 for it. And we say, I subjectively value the car more than my, those $5,000 and the, you know, the seller, it's the other way around. He values the, the money more than the car. So there's no question. Is there an equality of valuation there subjectively? Is there some like intrinsic value, something in the two items that are equal and that's why we're exchanging them? No. And in fact, if, if they had equal value in that sense, what would be the point of trading? You would just, you know, you would just be getting something. So clearly we each, think we're getting the more valuable thing. So we couldn't both be getting the heavier thing or the thing with more mass or with more, you know, positive charge. That would be impossible, but we can both think we get, we walked away from that with the more valuable stuff, which is, you know, kind of interesting. And that's because value is subjective used in that sense. But that trade now establishes, ah, right at that moment, the market price of that car was $5,000. And then accountants can use that when they do their books. And so that's, an objective valuation of that 
that goes into economic calculation, which is what Mises thought, you know, was the underpinning of civilization, basically. So that's kind of the relation between subjective valuation and objective market pricing. Yeah, uh, you've, you've been intrigued to know that Marx actually says so far as use values are concerned, uh, it is quite sensible to argue that both sides can receive a gain and use value out of exchange. So if you get away from the labor theory of value garbage, uh, which Marxists have stuck with uh, because that gave them the idea of the tendency for the rate of profit to fall and that explained why they're going to end up ultimately have socialism. Uh, that's their particular fallacy. Get rid of it. You'll find a very rich theory of, of, uh, of value in Marx. And uh, I wouldn't ask you to read all of Marx was I, when, I, when I actually did that myself. I read all these economic works from 1844 through to after his death in 1897. I stacked up the books. Uh, just curious, how tall were they? And they were slightly short, slightly lower than a tennis court net, just oh, wow. under three feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, how the fuck did he write that much stuff in the 19th century with basically a quill? I mean, I'm, I'm just in, in awe of his productivity. And that was just what he wrote on economics. That doesn't include his political writings. Uh, I read the I read the, eight, uh, well, the 18th premier of Louis, Louis Napoleon as part of that. Feet, yeah, three feet, ghost. <laughs> okay, three feet. Uh, that back in those days, the tennis player, you made sure the middle of the net was three foot high. And I was a top class tennis player, so that was my that was my metric. Um, yeah, so the, but I but he, enormous. He wrote all these papers for the he wrote for the New York Times as a correspondent on Europe. An unbelievable amount of writing. Um, so you don't want to read that, but if you do want to slog through, I can send you. A link to my um, unpublished PhD thesis on Marx's theory of value. Yeah, and I would I would look to that. You'd imagine. Okay. Yeah, it's, and that it's, when it's, you be... yeah when I because I I said I listened to you on Lex Friedman and that was part that was interesting to me too when you were explaining you know how Marx yeah, viewed okay. things because all I really know is you know Mises and Bambavark. Di you know, dismantling him, and so it's probably not a fair thing to read someone who says, "Here's what he believes," and let me knock it down. That's that's all I really know of Marx. So yeah, um, Bon Bar work was fascinating on that front because I mean he was quite right. The the, the so-called resolution of the transformation problem by Marx in the third volume of Capital was just an arithmetic example where it happened to work, but you put it in general mathematics and that fails. And do, are you aware of Ian Stevens' work on Marx? Uh. -uh. Okay, Ian Stephen was a Sraffian economist, so that basically means he does that, you know, linear algebra as applied to um, economic theory. And part of his, his part of the uh, Cambridge controversy, the, the, the on the on the UK Cambridge side attacking um, neoclassicals, and he's one of the ones who proved that if you don't have re-switching, then you don't have switching either. Technology never changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, he decided to play, take that Sraffian um, sledgehammer to Marx and wrote a book called Marx After Schraffer. Which I, I recommend. It's it's extremely high quality piece of piece of work, um, and I've now suddenly lost my bloody train of thought. Uh, but he he took a page. He, he showed Bombarwick's point was quite right uh, in using the algebra. That his Marx uh, Bombarwick's critique of Marx was quite accurate. But that's a critique of the labor theory of value. And what I show in that uh, that my thesis is that Marx had the labor theory of value for thirteen years. He developed in eighteen forty four. And he then, in 1857, when he was writing the Grundrisse, which is the rough draft of Capital, he reread Hegel. And here we're getting to philosophers again. So he, read, he got a copy, he had a copy of Hegel's, I think it's for Phenomenology of Right or Philosophy of Right. I haven't read them either, so I'm, I'm a bit in the dark here. And he gave a copy to Otto Brau. And then Otto Brau dropped into his flat in Chelsea, a house in Chelsea, returned the copy. So in the middle of reading, uh, all the classical economists, Marx rereads Hegel. And it was it's quite remarkable when you know this history because when you read the Grundrisse, these rough, rough notes for writing Marx, it, it's like reading Hunter S. Thompson. If you know the Hunter S. Thompson reference, okay, now he's on cocaine, now he's stoned, you know, you can sort of tell. Mm. Well, suddenly Marx's writing changes from Ricardo to, um, um, you know, dialectical philosophy yeah. on a dime. And then in the middle of that, he says, is not use value, the, the, the Marxian, the, the, the labor theory of value stuff, ridicules the role of use value. But Marx then starts to use value and exchange value. says, is not use value a, a part of value as the opposite of exchange value? Does this have significance in economics? And all this musing, he ended up developing a, a philosophical approach 
of his dialectic to explain where value comes from. And that was what was really his transformation. But it ended up contradicting the labor theory of value. And he worked that out very rapidly. And when he got the contradiction, you could see his mind saying, oh, hell, how do I get this back? And he then makes a total logical piece of bullshit. And, and it says, okay, the ultimate, they said, uh, the opposite of capital cannot be a one, this or that commodity. Uh, it must be all commodities. Oh, and the essence of all commodities is labor. Sorry, bullshit warning. Okay. And then that's if you preserve the labor theory of value. And then again, Marx is reading this stuff. Uh, there's 10 pages of capital where he goes through and you know, confuses people to say that a machine can only give the value it's had added to it, which contradicts his philosophical argument. So mm. I, I managed to untangle all that and I've ended up with what I regard as Marx's actual theory of value. And it's, again, much richer than you'd expect. Okay. And so, that's what's all spelled out in your dissertation? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'd love to take a look at that. It, it's coming your way by email. Yeah. All right. Great. Mm -hmm. Bob, Bob, I've got to get you to uh, read the list now. And these are okay. some complicated names. So I hope, you know, you've had right. an hour and 15 minutes. I to get prepare. Ready to get all right. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, just go at it. Um, I have sound effects here and uh, your, <laughs> the way you articulate the sounds coming out of your mouth is going to dictate what sound I press on this little board over here. So here it is. Top chatters and commenters from last week, read by Bob Murphy. Uh, Wells, I can't see the through thing. Wilson, uh, Dry Eye, Botched Mandela, Jonathan Lumen, Cobb fan, Ghost on the Half Shell, WWE fan 0104, Bob Liori, James James, Joe Polito, Capricious, Tom Roberts, Jens Runberg, Paul Lebo, J Bay 088, Jovian R, The Atheist Paladin, Snurt Richard, Buster Beagle, <laughs> The Libertarian, Michael DeSouza Cruz, Man O'Haran, Bazniat, William Turner, Warren Ellis, Lana Dell hates the clock, K -K -K Cobb, The <laughs> Minstrel 55, Political Economy 101, Lost Adult, Bully Pulpit 2000, Wayne McMillan, Apple Scab, and Leighton Watkins. Hmm. Pretty good. Yep. You, you, you well. did pretty good, Bob. That's yeah. uh, that's up there in the, you know, what have you done? 42 of these shows. Now you're, I'd say for guests reading them, that's, that's top five. You did All a good right. job All there. right. I'll take yeah. it. I'll take um, it. Um, it's a big, big thing, right? Reading that list. If you ever come back on the show, you actually have to perform. So you did a good job. You've, you've met one of the strict qualifications we have here at <laughs> Steve and friends, Bob, I want you to tell me about the Bob Murphy show. I know you, I've watched a few episodes. I, I know you've got two other podcasts you do, but mm -hmm. I just kind of focused on that one because it was your show. Tell me how you started that and you know what, what is the goal of it? Sure. Uh, I, I mean, it's the kind of thing, you know, uh, be the change you want to see in the world that, I, there were certain podcasts that I liked and then I just, you know, what is it that I like about them? And I realized it would be good if there was a podcast that had this kind of content. And I said, all right, well, then I'm going to go ahead and do it. So, yeah, it's just uh, a forum for me to interview people that I find interesting. But in practice, it tends to be you know, obviously economics, but also uh, even like pure math. Like we had people arguing about, uh, you know, various sets of infinity and things like this. Uh, of course, you know, Girdle's incompleteness theory, and we cover stuff like that, like popular results just that get used a lot in other fields, and just to say, what what is the actual result? Um, and just in physics, too, that, you know, that's one of my, like we talked about earlier. So just interesting conversations. The point, you know, I'll have Warren Mosler on, people like it. It's not to beat somebody, but let, but just to, just to my own understanding to say, how do you, you know, here's a conundrum that I have with your worldview. How do you deal with that? You know, and, and have things like that. We had the one drop in uh, your, I think, you know, I'm Douglas Robert talking about MMT. He's saying I'm totally wrong about the yield curve. So I said, hey, come on on. And like I said, the, the thing is, if the person is earnest, I think that's probably the best word. And, and you know, and has something interesting to say, that's kind of the criterion for getting on. 
Yeah, no, I, D- Douglas, uh. I really like his work. So he, he obviously t- follows the MMT framework, but what I really like from him is he's, he's coming up with novel approaches um, using computer science and uh, machine learning um, to see if there's a predictive nature from the framework of MMT and then, you know, feeding that into an algorithm. So it's very interesting to me and I, I happen to like Doug a lot. So I think you, you that episode you're going to have uh, in the next few weeks come out. Oh, in like him? the next 48 hours. I think it's the one dropping next. So next, you heard it here. Next 48 hours, Douglas, the MMT macro trader will be on the Bob Murphy show. The question is, will, Steve Keen ever be on the <laughs> Murphy show? He's certainly welcome to. <laughs> yeah, and no, I'm very, very happy to do that. I Actually, I might, uh, you might, you might find it interesting to have a discussion about value theory if I send you that paper on Marx, because that's um, uh, interesting. And also, we haven't actually talked about our Minsky software all that much. Have you had any uh, exposure to Minsky? Only. Um by hearing people refer to him and then, yeah, when I think when Doug was on, ironically enough that you're mentioning that Steve, that, yeah, I said, is this kind of Minsk? And it made me realize I need to go read Minsky. Cause again, if you rely on secondhand accounts often that, that no, that's not, you, you have to go read it yourself. Okay. I was actually talking about a software package, but what I'll oh, do I'm is. I'm sorry. I the, the actual Minsky. Okay. I, I've, no, written, no. I've written a software. I've developed a software package named after Hyman Minsky. Okay. Um, which is to enable non-linear monetary modeling of the economy. Um, so uh, I'll pop you a link to that as well. Won't okay. do it now because it's eight o'clock over here and it's time to spend some time with my wife and maybe get some dinner. Um, but uh, yeah, well, I'll put it all together after the show. Okay, and, great. Uh, Tom, I could hate, hate to tell you how to do your job, but we should actually answer some of the questions that have popped yeah, up from so, the uh, discussion so any, people. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of it, it's been, uh, you know, popping off ever since I said uh, the chat is dead. So I've missed everything. If anybody has any specific questions for either Steve, Bob, or maybe even me, even though, what do I know? Um, <laughs> just put, you know, question at Bob, what the question is, or question at Steve, and we'll try to we'll try to get to a, a few of them. Um, we had Tony Wilson asking about nuclear at one point there. Uh, at the very beginning? Yeah, yeah the beginning. way, way back. Oh, yeah. Before we started, I think he was... Yeah, I don't know. I wonder if this program save that he said something it, like the two economist views that i always get and but he didn't say what they were but he obviously didn't like them i, I believe was the take yeah, yeah. way way if you, if you scroll through the stuff off the not on the visual screen you can oh my god there's a lot there yeah oh, and busy, i think they? Uh, i think yeah. but once uh, the stream Tony starts was, yeah uh and asking also about the bank of england paper the 2014 bank of england paper have you read that one, Bob? If it's the one I'm thinking, the one about like deposits, lending creates deposits that like, to, yeah, to go, yeah I, yes. Just, do you yeah. want me to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah. I, I, if it's, again, I think it sounds like I'm, I'm referring to the same thing you are. So in my book, yeah. Understanding Money Mechanics, that's actually one of the chapters, as I say, do the textbooks get money in banking backwards or something? And I go through it. So I tried to, sort of reconcile both like to say they're two different approaches. So real quick, um, like if a central bank is targeting a certain interest rate and then the demand for loans, you know, increases. And and so like b- banks get constrained by, you know, reserves getting drained, then that can make the federal funds rate go above the target rate. And so if the fed wants to keep that target, they have to buy more assets, create more reserves and put it in. So if that's what you mean, that given a Fed's target for the federal funds rate, then private sector, you know, bank lending determines the level of reserves. Yes, that's true. But if you go the other way, like you could say, no, ultimately the Fed absolutely determines reserves and no, you know, private banks can't create reserves, then, you know, that's also a true statement, but it's, they can't both create reserves and determine what the market clearing level of the federal funds rate is, I agree that. So that's kind of the way I tried to handle it to say from where they're coming from. Yes, I can make sense of those statements, but still the old school way of looking at it, it is correct insofar as it goes, but maybe it's not as helpful in the modern. I think if you want to say that's just not a helpful framework, but I don't think it's like false. Yes. I, I think the ultimate one is false. Um, okay. 
And uh, what we've done with Minsky as a software package is uh, enable building of uh, models of monetary flows using double entry bookkeeping. So Minsky as a software package develops a system of integrated double entry bookkeeping accounts and it ties the, I must say, ties the master at using that software. Um, what's the biggest system you've built? How many tables and how many um, rows would you just, say? Just bringing it up right now. So keep talking. Yeah, sure. I'll so put, I'll put it on. See what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. But, but you guys got to keep talking. Okay. Okay. Sing. Give us a sing, Bob. Come on. <laughs> You have got uh, quite a quite a quite a good singing voice. There's better ones than that one, but yeah, that <laughs> that, that was a tough song. Um, no, no, to, to, to be fair, to be fair to Bob, I watched that whole video. I put it through a sound analyzer, and I found the most off key sections I could find because I thought that was the whole point. Are you being serious, or you're are you kidding? Uh, no, I'm being he's serious. A, oh, so that really I was like the worst. That's like that clips was, of when like Jordan turns yeah. the ball over or something, and that's what you're going to hide. Okay. Well, no, actually, I feel better about it because, yeah, I knew there was some. Okay, if that was the worst, that's not because I did hit the one, so it's good. Uh, can now, I say, ask you? So, so, there, was some, uh, there was some other parts there that you did really well, but it wouldn't have been funny for me to click right, that right, out right, right. put it so. <laughs> what um, are you going to say? So, Steve, the d- are you saying like I guess maybe we're talking past each other, but if someone wants to say, oh, like the, the you know open market, oh, when the if the Federal Reserve wants to loosen, they go buy assets that creates reserves, and then the commercial banks can lend out, you know, pyramided on top of those. Um, I mean, you you agree that the commercial banks can't create reserves, and so yeah, I agree are, they can't. So if there's a reserve yeah. requirement, like that is kind of a constraint. And so but the, the reserves are cre- reserves are created by the government running a deficit, and uh, the beauty of Minsky is you can do the accounting of this quite accurately. And like I've had, had people who don't realize, oh, we better maximize our screens here so you can see the image properly. Yeah, Bob, yeah so. I'll, uh, I'm working on it. I'm just okay. Here you go. Let's just maximize. Just give you an idea what Minsky looks oh, like anyway. Not okay. So I all there. alone. I don't have Dan here helping me. So I've got to. It's click a black a box. Get it? Yeah. Yeah, I know at the moment. On, yeah. We're gonna work on the black box part here. Okay. So do you want me to go to the godly tables, Steve? First. Go to the godly table. That's that's the particularly that that's a flow chart. If you've used a system that I make software, you've ever seen it before, then it, that's similar on that front. But what Minsky does is add this capacity as well. So you've got double entry bookkeeping accounts here. And double entry does constrain what's feasible, what's possible to do. So neoclassical talk about lending out reserves, and it's very easy to show. The only way that can happen if loans are in cash. If loans are not cash, if they're increasing a deposit account, you cannot, the, 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 the model simply does not work. Um, so there's various things which double entry bookkeeping prohibits the possibility of, which economists think can happen, which is why I was so completely pissed off when the uh, Nobel Prize mob gave the bloody Nobel Prize to bloody Bernanke for his work on money. <laughs> yeah. You know, after, after this Bank of England paper came out, and one thing that really pissed me off was that uh, shortly after that happened, was, this is sometime this year, I think, there was a discussion between Jason Furbin, I think his name is, who was the chair of the uh, President Council of Economic Advisor, advisors yeah. for, uh, for um, Trump, uh, saying how important it is to teach the money multiplier. And that's seven years or nine years after the Bank of the Coast said the money multiplier does not exist. You know, so it's, it's again, it's crazy how they don't, they're not only don't not read history, they don't need contemporary stuff like people know what they're talking about, about how the economy and the monetary system actually functions. Ty's diving in here in the screen, Bob. So uh, this is an incredibly complicated model. This is like the Mandelbrot set. Whew. Yeah, so, that you, know, <laughs> you know, this is not, Bob, what you, the traditional equilibrium style difference equation mm-hmm. fuckery that you see in from neoclassicals. It is actually um, system dynamics is used in engineering, right, to, to study complex system, how a bridge oscillates in the wind. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of uh, one of its purposes. Um, and it's been taken up in the social sciences to study behavior over time. Um, and this model, uh, for me, it's not, 
I'm not trying to predict the quantitative behavior of the American economy. I think it's kind of, for me, turning into what is the story of, of the evolution of capitalism? How does a capitalistic society, society evolve and economy evolve over time, right? And so I'm trying to look for those complex behaviors, right? And I'll just simulate the model. And this is without any, you know, parameter ad, ad, uh, adjustment. So it's all endogenous behavior, the business cycle. Um, so it's, 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 I hope it's something you'll look into a little more. I know, I know where Austrians stand on mathematical modeling, but this is definitely not a traditional way to do it in economics. Um, and it's, it's about connecting your stocks and your flows. And it's not, it's not that I say, and this is, I, I think I heard from an Austrian, might have been you. Um, I'm, I don't say money flows between accounts. An account gets debited and an account gets credited. But what is flowing is the flow of information over time and aggregated. Um, so that's why this is, you know, system dynamics is stocks and flows, um, emergent properties or emergent behaviors over time. Um, and obviously, like any model, it is dependent on the parameters you set in it. Um, but it's everything is a closed loop. You know, it, a lot of models are what you call an open loop. So if you change the interest rate, less people are going to consume. Okay, but what happens to consumption if less people consume and such and such and such and such, and then that feeds back into interest rates? And I'm just using a, a hypothetical there. Uh, let me stop sharing this. So I, I have to say it's very cool software. I designed it. Um, I didn't write it. It was written by a top-class um, uh, mathematical physicist and uh, uh, and computer programmer. Uh, he's one of my best friends as well, I better say, Russell Standish. He's coded it. Uh, but, but Ty turned up in my circle, and they've got a, a rub, you know, fat Ty on the back here. He, we had a previous discussion, which the guy called Dan, whom we haven't met today, um, organised, called COVID and Climate Correlation. I think it was. It wasn't the name, Ty? COVID? And, I'll actually let me... Welcome do the voice, back. yeah. Do the yeah. voice. Okay. This is Dan's old intro for the previous iteration of the show. Welcome to COVID and climate correlations. I'm your host, Daniel Sanderson, with post Keynesian economist Professor Steve Keen. That's how the show let's just started. say the show's improved dramatically since yeah. those days. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, so just before that happened, because the COVID was happening. And Minsky is designed for modeling monetary dynamics as well as actual uh, system dynamics as well, but particularly the monetary side using double entry bookkeeping. And one thing about double entry bookkeeping, the money is either in your account or somebody else's account. Now that's exclusive categories. And that also applies to mod the dominant model of uh, pan a pandemic, which is called the SEARD model, which stands for susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, dead. And you're either one or the other. So you could use the Minsky's table to build up you know, quite a reasonable model of the pandemic, which I did a demo of, which had five, each of those five states. So Ty turns up as one of the people on the discussion here. And he says, I I've done build a model of the pandemic in Minsky. Would you like to see it? And I go, yeah, sure. Okay. I send it to me. Quite honestly, my reaction when I opened Ty's model was, fucking duck. I've never seen anything so sophisticated and complex mm -hmm. and well-designed as well. And that's how we became part of our circle. So um, uh, I know I'm the person who designed Minsky, but by far the uh, impresario of using it is Ty. And that model you showed you a moment ago ties together a number of my models in different areas. So models on climate change, models on monetary dynamics, models on energy and so on. He's put them all together in one incredibly sophisticated model, but it's mind blowing to try to read the damn thing. So my preferred way to handle Minsky is to go from a set of simple models further forward. I'm writing a book on that basis right now. Okay, well, great. Yeah, I, I should probably clarify that I'm a bit more eclectic than like some of the more dogmatic. So I think you I said, Steve, you had looked at my critique of uh, Samuelson, right? So yeah. I was trying to show what's the problem with the standard one good model in terms of capital yeah. theory. So the obvious thing to do was to do a two good model. And that's what yeah. I did and just showed, you see how it gets way more complicated if there's a capital and consumption. Whereas if I just said, oh, you can't, the economy is more complex than people wouldn't have understood the precise problem between one to two goods 
if I just gave it, you know, throw up your hands and say, hey, the economy is really complicated. You can't model it with a mathematical model that, yeah, you know, yeah. that is an art, you know, that's a defensible statement. But in terms of, you know, so I built and even too, like with um, Austrian business cycle theory, it never got published, but I did a very crude model, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, trying to just it, even like um, modern expositions of it, they'll have like five sectors, like, you know, mining, processing, manufacturing, distribution, consumption to kind of show a Hayekian triangle. And this, this. so there's implicit models that even Austrians and the canonical works use. And, you know, what's the, if you're going to use it, go ahead and make it more rigorous and internally consistent and, and so forth. So it's, I'm not against modeling. I guess Austrians though tend to be very leery about like, let's not take it too seriously. Like, like my favorite yeah. example of that, you know, danger for a con is, the market monitorist school, Scott Sumner, I don't know if he's on your radar. He's their big champion. Uh, and he's always like to explain what happened in 2010. He'll say, Oh, uh, you know, people in the private sector made forecasts about, they thought NGDP growth was going to be such. And I said, Scott, most people in private sector don't know what NGDP is. So that's, you know what mm. I mean? Like in his model, that's what's going on. So there's little things like okay. that. Where, yeah. I, I agree completely. I mean, that's why I poked a tongue out at the whole idea. I mean, They've got models of, of mythical foundations, uh, the mythical outcomes, and you talk to actual people, there's no way that they, you know, like they, the Euler equation they're supposed to use for consumption. Yeah. Nobody goes and works out what's going to happen in the you know, 500 years future for repaying <laughs> the government debt. And if you read the original Euler paper by Robert Barrow, he actually used altruism as a way of justifying Ricardian equivalence. Altruism from a neoclassical economist? Give me a fucking break. <laughs> By the way, Tony's put his question back up here again, so let's, let's maybe finish an answer to discussing this. Um, uh, yeah, you're saying the reason you keep on talking power stations because if we don't fix energy, nothing else matters, and it's economists who are in the road. Um, I've got an ambivalent feeling about that, and I don't. this might raise the climate change discussion because I think that if we the energy crisis and the, the and global warming at the same time are actually a better form of a climate crisis than we could have if we kept on you know, putting the load on the planet we're doing and had a biodiversity crisis. So in some ways, I would rather see us solving energy after we realise we've got to reduce our consumption levels on the planet uh, than if we just had solar right, uh, nuclear working right now we'd just add to the other forms of energy we're using and cause an even more extreme impact upon the, um, upon the biosphere. And that's, that's the thing I'm most worried about these days, Robert, is the, what we're doing to the biosphere. Uh, I'm just curious. I, I know your concerns. What, what do you want? Like, do you think there should be a carbon tax or how have you talked about what, what would they do? I think, well, for a start, I think we're an overshoot. I think mm -hmm. we're about using, about two to three times the level of the planet can actually support at the moment. So we're an overshoot, you've got to go backwards. And to go backwards, you've got to reduce consumption. Uh, but you can't reduce consumption if you impose those burdens on the poor, both poor nations and poor people within rich nations. So we have to have uh, a form of restriction of consumption. And this has got, you know, forget the market in this case, it'll be like Second World War where you want to reduce consumption to focus all the resources you can on the war effort and that led to rationing so i think if we're going to hang, hang on to our societies in the future uh, we're going to have to have rationing at some point but that won't be accepted until such time as the public has the same attitude to the climate threat that it had to hitler and mm -hmm. that didn't happen with the second world war until after we'd lost poland we've lost uh, france and there are a quarter of a million british troops facing being slaughtered on the beaches of dunkirk mm -hmm. and then people agreed we should do something about about Hitler. Uh, so I, I think we're in the pre-Hitlerian stage now. Uh, hold by on, the way, are you in New hold York? On, are you hold in New on, York, Bob? Hold on, yeah. hold on. We got a nice comment directed at me. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Boost my ego. Now, let's, uh, let's just stop. Okay, so let's get some contacts here with Bob. Now, I watched, actually, because I've been trying to research Bob in preparation for this. I watched you. You were in front of Congress. Um, and you basically tore apart that I can't remember which model you were referring to. Was it a Nordhaus model? I can't remember, but you tore it apart. And I, I, I was like, well, okay, I like Bob a little bit more now because I have some issues with the, the mainstream econ climate models, but where do you stand 
on climate change in general? Um, so, yeah, so what you're talking about, right, I, the one I got, Nordhaus's DICE model, I went in there and as of like the 2007 version, I understood how that works pretty well. And I kept tabs on him a little bit as he's tweaked it. And what I was specifically doing, what maybe the thing you're talking about, I think I was, I presented twice, uh-huh. once the house and once the Senate, the conventional like social cost of carbon literature, like a lot of the difference was just the discount rate you plug in. There was things like that, that, you know, it, and I was just trying to show the impact of various assumptions and, and how that can, you know, you can get almost any number you want to pop out, even a negative one with some of the, the models they were using at the time. Um, meaning they should subsidize emissions if you just turn that one dial, you know, to, to one thing. Um, so I guess I believe that more emissions, other things equal raises, you know, the, the temperature. I think mm-hmm. a lot of the arguments over the feedbacks and, you know, that's where a lot, you know, the thing is, like, is it just concerning or is it like catastrophic? And that's, I think, where the argument is. I guess my big picture w- with what you're saying, Steve, is even if I agreed with you on in terms of what the situation is to give governments the power to impose rationing to, to me, I wouldn't trust them to do it because they care about the climate. Like I, I don't trust them with that much power. So I'm, I'm not solving the problem that you're bringing up, but I don't mm. see how that's a solution. Well, I'm, 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 I think my choice is between uh, authoritarian governments or Mad Max. And I don't like either option, but I right. prefer the former. So that's that's the perspective I've taken. How do we hang together moderately com- uh, complex societies in the face of the breakdown of our productive capabilities on the planet? That's that's the future that I think we face. And I've also, by the way, pulled apart Nordhaus um, in great detail because it isn't the discount rate that matters. If you read his critique of Stern, the 2007 paper he wrote, uh, problems in the CERN report, he says the discount rate is there so that damages in the far future don't overwhelm the minor damages in the next two centuries. Now, how did he get minor damage in the next two centuries? He assumed a roof would protect you from climate change. He didn't write it quite that stupidly. He said that most of the economy operates in carefully controlled environments, which will be negatively, negatively affected by climate change. And they included all of manufacturing, all of wholesale and retail services, all of the finance sector, all of government, and he even put mining in there because he apparently he neglected under, uh, open cut mining. He said 87% will be unaffected and there'll be 3% heavily affected and 10% marginally affected. And the 3% was mainly farming and, and forestry. And he said there'd be positives and negatives. So his overall effect was a one quarter of 1% uh, fall in GDP out of a three degree increase in global temperatures. Now, I'm working with climate scientists, think of three to four degrees. Um, most of them are in agreement. Half a million, maybe half a billion humans will survive. And I think what economists have done, and there's neoclassical economists in this case, again, have set us up for the greatest crisis in the history of humanity. And one, I was about to ask you, do you live in New York? No, I'm in Massachusetts, not right now. Ah, oh, okay. So you, you, you watch the showers from a distance rather than experiencing the... The, uh, the the downpour yesterday, right, right, yeah. So I think we're going to see more and more catastrophic events like that, and and they're going to you know, they'll be destroying productive capabilities. So like Nordhaus's idea about manufacturing being safe because it occurs in carefully controlled environments, he neglected this thing called roads, for example, and mm-hmm. railways, which are necessary to connect one factory to another. And even if it was true that a factory would be protected because it has a roof. You've got to get goods from one factory to another to produce output. And if the factory, the roads and bridges are being destroyed, which happened in Vancouver last year, you you haven't got a productive system. So it's truly ignorant garbage. And I think, I frankly think they should be pulled. Ultimately, they should be sued for negligence because if they'd kept their fucking faces out of it, we would have listened to the scientists. Instead, people have listened to the economists, believing they listen to the scientists, and that's led us into this catastrophic overshoot. Well, uh, Steve's going off. Okay, so let's let's <laughs> assume, and I, I I see this perspective from Bob. We don't know w- yeah. what the feedbacks are. We I think Bob and I will both agree that, uh, like you said, emissions, uh, all other things equal, are going to drive temperatures up. And there's potentially damage from that. Let's just say we agree on that. Whether you do, Bob, to a 
bigger degree or lesser degree than me. Um, is is the private sector resilient enough to come up with solutions without go government intervention for such a scenario where uh, uh, t warming temperatures do cause damage to our infrastructure? Okay, so I, I would say, you know, at, at face value, I, I can't answer that question, right? I mean, for all I know, there's an asteroid coming towards Earth that no matter what we do, we're going to get destroyed. And you said, Bob, can the free market fix that? I can't say yes. Like, you know, <laughs> there could be something that's impossible no matter what our social organization is to stop. So it is logically possible for sure that we're on runaway climate change. Nothing's going to stop it. And the free market wouldn't fix it either. But again, what I would say though, is my general response to, you know, all kinds of issues like this is I don't think so. Therefore the, the best thing to do is to take, you know, just looking at the actual people running governments around the world right now and to say those people, let's give them more power in the name of fighting climate change to go ahead and do these things. So I think, I do think a lot of the alarm and I'm hoping is, is misplaced, but if, it, if I'm wrong and it isn't ultimately, yeah, I think they're going to do stuff like send up mirrors and put sulfur dioxide in there and Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of the, the other geoengineering things, um, was the, the Tyson, uh, the Dyson sphere guy, Freeman, he had all kinds of ideas about, uh, geo, you know, genetically modifying trees. So they, they absorb more carbon. So I think they would do stuff like that eventually. Cause I, I don't think there's going to be a glow. I think it's gonna be the worst of both worlds with the political solution that they will come to more and more agreements, but it wouldn't actually solve the problem even on like Steve's own terms, but they'll still take the power in the name of doing it. But in practice, <laughs> what they're doing doesn't fix the problem. They just seized a bunch of power. So well, I think in fact, I, my, I have a similar skepticism to the government and like I actually ran for par parliament and it, quite unsuccessfully in Australia last year. And I think the problem actually is the political system itself, the way we select leaders. Because basically we say, anybody here a narcissist? Anybody here a sociopath? Why don't you take, you know, because that's, that's the sort of person who runs and the right. sort of person right. who wins. Mm -hmm. And the, the perspective I've come in favour of over time is sortition. If you look back at the original Athenian democracies, they didn't uh, elect. They they were, they had a system, quite a complicated system at about a dozen or so levels, where they'd ask, I think the seven major families would be asked to nominate somebody or set of people, and then they'd be asked to nominate, and they'd nominate, and they'd nominate. And about 10 or 11 steps forward, finally, would be a group of citizens would be selected. And therefore, it, you, you did not choose narcissists you choose people who are representative to a reasonable degree of the of the of the uh, educated culture of athenium and i think we, we're kidding ourselves to call we have a democracy we have a, a shit show of you know popularity shit show where the worst possible people get selected and you you of course your country is is the out, like, outstanding example of how bad that can be USA, USA, USA. <laughs> uh, you know, as a Canadian, we we actually well, we adored watching you guys have Trump. That was entertaining, and Biden's pretty entertaining too. Um, America is entertaining. Go Amer USA. We're number one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. UK is not uh, far behind you, by the way. Yeah, uh, Bob. You know, final message here. Um, how can economics um, as a field be better going into the future? Your personal thoughts on it. Give it to me. Uh, I think uh, the probably the biggest problem I have with most economists is the confidence with which they tell the public things that they yeah. can't possibly be as sure about what they're saying. And, and so that's to me like just extreme arrogance and, you know, just misplaced confidence, I think is, is probably my biggest concern. That the, the, we agree with you, and that's partly with system dynamics gives you ways to see, you know, through some of the fog. Um, but you, the, the level of arrogance that has come out of mainstream economists, and this is why Nordhaus dived into climate change. He knew nothing about it, and he just dived in and thought he could instantly take it over. And unfortunately, he succeeded. So that's the uh, the great tragedy. No other profession. No other intellectual discipline generates the level of arrogance that economics generates, particularly amongst neoclassicals, and their willingness to dive into areas which they have no knowledge of and tell the people how to do it, which is what they've done in climate change in particular. So I agree entirely. There's far too much arrogance in economics. 
Thank you. And that's been a pleasure to talk to you on that front, by the way. Very much so. Yeah, th thanks for having me. This was this was very pleasant. I I'm not surprised. I, I you know I just could tell your personality. I thought this was going to be people like, oh, you got guts coming in here. I I thought this was going to be a pleasant conversation. So and it was. Yeah, which which it was. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Cool. And we we will we will do this again. Maybe you know we we'll try not to have you too many times in a row, but. We definitely got to do this again. I think uh, you're. I don't want to become thought. the Taylor Swift of the Steve Keenan Friends show. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was great. The two hours went fast. Everybody, thank you for tuning yeah. in. We didn't get to a lot of questions <laughs> just because, you know, Steve. I think there's just so there's a, an explosion of intellect between Steve and Bob um, that they kind of just ran the show and that was good a lot of good information i'll try to time stamp the episode um because there's a lot of different parts to unpack we'll do it again bob thank you big, big like i'm i'm really grateful that you'd come on spend the saturday morning with us um and give some good proper insights into austrian economics because like you said on the internet there's sideliners and you know anybody saying anything right so it's good to hear it from a leading figure like yourself until next week we've got another guest make sure you hit that like button i i looked at youtube there and there wasn't enough likes you're around 70 likes we need more likes more likes more likes we've got a, a, the algorithm so we can bump this show up uh, youtube um doesn't care if i put lots of gel in my hair and wear a suit it cares about likes and view time so Make sure you hit the like button. Comment afterwards. If you if I didn't get to any of your questions, which I didn't get to any, put them in the comments underneath. If they're directed towards Bob, I'll send Bob a message and maybe he'll come on and give a response. Same with Steve. Until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>